Welcome. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, the independent cultural center for America in the Netherlands. Welcome to this discussion on art and activism in America now. Some things about today's gathering uh, are a little different than we expected. This whole event came about in close collaboration with Kunsthal Kade in Amersfoort, where director Robert Droos curated a fascinating exhibition of today's politically engaged art called This is America. Sadly, <laughs> sadly, the exhibition has had to close because of the COVID-19 measures announced by the Dutch government. We also had to do a quick change of venue because our partner, the public library OBA, also had to close Monday evening. We are therefore very grateful to Studio Westhaven for their last minute hospitality in this beautiful studio. Well, we are all still here and so are our guests, the American artists Dred Scott and Alexa Garcia joining us online from the US and the Dutch artist Patricia Kaarsenhout and the director of Kunsthalkade, Robert Roos, here in the studio. Thank you for joining us for this discussion, and we hope that you'll send us your questions and comments via the chat function on our YouTube channel. Robert, good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you for joining us in this big adventure. Yes. And uh, I'd like to invite you to introduce our American guest first. Yes. Uh, from New York, uh, Drescott, uh, an artist who is working um, with themes of uh, the black history and slavery and uh, civil rights movements. And he is using historical events and signs and uh, gives them a very contemporary meaning. And we are also joined by Alexa Garcia, also from New York. Uh, she's a visual artist, a performer. Um, she does poetry. She's an activist. She's an organizer. And her works uh, are really focusing on human aspects of the interaction with uh, things that happen in society. And I have the honor of introducing our Dutch guest here at the table, Patricia Kaarsenhout. Uh, an artist of uh, Surinamese descent who has for many years already been deeply engaged with issues of color, identity, race and racism and also the role of black women in history and uh, an aspect of history that has uh, uh, escaped notice for far too long. Is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah, okay. thank you. Good. Thank you for the introduction. And wonderful to be with these two wonderful artists in the program. Yeah, it's yeah. really an honor. I'm glad to bring the U.S. and the Netherlands together like this. <laughs> yeah. um, Robert, before we get to talking about the exhibition and how it all came about, let's look at uh, number two, video number two, the trailer of your exhibition, This Is America. I, to some swear, I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Robert, I am so sorry that because of Corona, this exhibition, which you worked so hard on, has had to close so suddenly. The idea was that we would send everybody there yeah, hopefully, during yeah. the Christmas vacation yeah. to, to have a look because it was really an impressive show. Too Alas. bad. Yeah. The only good thing about it is that on that same day, the Electoral College uh, voted to, uh, uh, select, to elect President Biden as president-elect. Yes, definitely. Yeah. That was uh, within the sadness a moment of joy. <laughs> yeah. The ex this whole project was um, a three-month-long road trip all across the U.S., which culminated in this book mm -hmm. with your adventures, a really interesting read. Okay, uh, thank you. It goes in depth in a different way the ex than the exhibition does. Certainly does, yeah. Uh, and then the exhibition itself. 
What did you learn during this trip, during this adventure? Um, what I learned is that America is such a diverse country. And normally I go to New York and L.A. and I know those cities quite well. But now I had the chance to go to cities like Detroit, Houston, Atlanta, uh, El Paso, but also Denver and Kansas City. And so you learn much more about America because New York and L.A. aren't specifically America. And uh, I encountered so many artists that are so deeply engaged to the identity of the group that they belong to. Um, and much more than I was used to in the Netherlands. So all those conversations really touched me. You mentioned something in the, the epilogue of your book that I thought was uh, striking. Um, you said, the, the trip through the U.S. also gave me the chance to become better acquainted with a number of social battlegrounds. And I thought, wow, has it come to this? Battlegrounds? Yeah, well, you, when you go to certain er uh, areas in America, definitely is. Uh, for example, in Detroit, in Hamtramck, uh, a city that went bankrupt in 2008, all those ha houses almost deteriorated overnight, and cans took, uh, gangs took over. And um, so a couple of artists started buying up houses and refurbished them uh, by their own means and kind of saved that area. Uh, by their work. So it's a kind of a mix between an artistic intervention, but also social work. And the same you can see in Houston at Project Grow Houses. But for example, a city like El Paso, uh, closely connected to Juarez in Mexico, which was, used to be a very symbiotic city, and the, the, the wall drove them apart, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And to speak to the artists and also visit Juarez and experience firsthand how that whole dynamics works. So you I mean, went to Juarez with one of the artists yes. in the exhibition yeah. and he accompanied you? He didn't want you to walk around by yourself? No, that was not, uh, not advice. No, no. no, no. It's, no. I mean, when I was there uh, just three we two weeks before, Isabella Cabanillas, uh, a member of one of the graffiti groups uh, in Juarez, was shot down by the and killed by the gangs. So that area is still very dangerous. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and you see how, how art is really in the middle of... Oh, absolutely. They're with their feet on the ground and in the ground and in the mud. <laughs> and, and, and really and engaging. A lot of artists engage directly with uh, social projects, mm. uh, for example, in penitentiaries, in, 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 in prisons or in neighborhoods. So th that kind of engagement I hardly ever see in the mm. Netherlands. Mm. And it was really interesting to, to delve deep into that activism. I know that uh, our guest, uh, Alexa Garcia, has also done work with prisons in the past. Could you say a word about that, Alexa, before we go further with the exhibition? Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Beautiful. So um, I'm a visual artist, and that's my first love. Uh, but I'm mostly known as a musician and a poet, and that's what I've been doing for the last 17 years. And the first body of work that really launched that trajectory in my life was looking at the intersections of state violence, displacement, and environmental injustice through the war on drugs and how it affects domestically through the prison system, but also abroad through what was Plan Colombia, who was a program funded by the United States and it started in the late 90s and went for about 10 years. Uh, and the whole point of it was to eradicate coca and poppy seeds from the Putumayo region. That was the face of it. But in a lot of ways, it was about getting the people out of that region because of the oil that is just below the soil. And so children under the age of two died from severe vomiting and diarrhea uh, within a couple of days. Uh, anybody two years and older became extremely ill. Ten years later, the pancreatic cancer in the region, which is one of the deadliest cancers, is at 89 percent. And so you see these disparities that are not just happening here and like what is the impact within the prison industrial complex and how our black and brown communities are impacted and affected. There, there's literally million dollar blocks in the United States where the mass incarceration system gains a million dollars by incarcerating people from those regions, right? It's, so how do it's we a business model. these things? Yeah. It's a business model completely, yeah. 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 Um, Robert, you, you wrote a, a very touching uh, Facebook post uh, yesterday about having to close this exhibition early. And in that post, you said something that I thought really went to the, the heart of the matter. You wrote, artists are the soul searchers, the seismographs who feel a country 
and are able to unlock its inner workings? Yeah, I think that's what I found. Um, and I think that's through deep engagement, not only deep engagement with the personal lives of the groups that they belong to, but to the country as well. Mm. Um, and it's a very humanistic yeah. uh, endeavor. And through visual arts with very strong um, yeah, visual ideas, you can, can really touch somebody uh, and, 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 and uh, try to get people to look better and learn. Uh, and I think that's what a lot of the artworks do mm. in the exhibition that I made. Mm -hmm. uh, could we have um, picture number uh, three, please? This is uh, uh, one of the eye catchers of the exhibition. This is uh, a car yes. and an art object by Hank Willis Thomas, yes. the founder of the uh, Public Action Artist Committee uh, for, Freedoms. for Freedoms. And you interviewed him in your book. And yeah. he says something that I had never really stopped to think about, how difficult it is and how distracting it has been for artists that you're continually surrounded, especially during the Trump years, by the media, the social media, and by this president who sucks all the oxygen out of the room with his own crazy media performance. So can you be a seismograph in spite of all this static from the media at the same time? Well, what I found when I talked to the artists and the critics and, 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 uh, and the galleries is Trump hardly ever came up. So really? You, you, we, of How course, is that possible? Because you speak about him shortly, but basically what kind of a nutcase it is, and then you move on and you move on to more important matters. Um. And that's how the daily life in the U.S. is uh, affected by everything that's happening. Um, the racism, the police violence, the, uh, the poor conditions. I learned a word in the U.S. that I had never heard before, food desert. Uh, where whole areas uh, have no shops with fresh food, only canned food. Uh, you can't imagine that. Uh, so the nutrition level is bad, the zoning. That's what you talk about, because that's what's happening in the cities. And Trump is indeed a distraction. And because he's such a nutcase, you can also quite easily isolate him in that way. Of course, he's dangerous, and people are aware of that. Maybe it's also a survival tactic. I think... Um, I think I also wrote that in one of the texts. Um, I had the feeling everybody was holding their breath. Uh -huh. uh, so I just took it out for those four years. And luckily, it was only four years. But just try to get to November 3rd and vote him out. Mm -hmm. That was the mentality when I traveled in 2019. And then the exhibition, which is like a, uh, like a uh, distilled version of Yeah, that was the... quite difficult because, I I, of course, I, saw, uh, I spoke to close to 100 people, so I really had to select. That's what curating is, selecting and... Killing your darlings. Kill your darlings. <laughs> uh, so I ultimately touched on four subjects that I found were important. That was the history of the black movement and especially Black Lives Matter now, where also the work of Dread is... Uh, shown um, the situation of the LA uh, HBQ. I've always have difficult getting the order of the letters right, and that that signifies the situation with the Supreme Court that really became very religious in the past years and threatened the rights of minorities of gay people. Um, so that was an important subject to touch. There's a uh, section about uh, Native Americans, uh, which is all about land rights. Uh, basically, America is a colonized country. Uh, um, they don't perceive themselves that way, but they colonized the land of the Native Americans. And the battle for that ground is still going on. And of course, there was a section um, derived from the El Paso visit about the situation at the border, mm -hmm. immigration. And of course, I had a room about Trump. And there was a room where people are sent to stage, and that's where the work of Alexa came in. And because people inhabit that country, and, and that's so that I found. And then the big room where the car was was dedicated to four freedoms, and the car of Hank Willis Thomas, who refers back to the Dukes of Hazard, the eponymous series in the 70s that glorified the South and the uh, Confederate flag and General Lee. I had no idea that it glorified the South. I and, completely missed that. No, and that's what the piece of Hank is about, because he was seven years old when that series was on television, and he loved, he those, loved, it. He loved those crashing cars and <laughs> this crazy sheriff. 
And only later on in life he realized what he was cheering, uh, that he was mm. cheering a flag and a person that are horrible. Uh, but also the nice story is that his mother let him watch that and didn't burden him at that age with the meaning of that flag. He just let him be, he, she just let him be this boy. Be a boy, yeah. Uh, yeah. And later on, of course, he... Um, and I think it's a brilliant piece. I think it's a monument for our times. Well, it's certainly been a, an eye-catcher, an icon for the exhibition. It is, seen yeah. this picture all over <laughs> yeah. the media, well, inevitably. Instagram. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> Let's but bring it's, it's, it's the the content that's, that's driving me to show this work. Yeah, yeah, well... Well done. Too bad. At least we still have the book. Yes. And this event. Yeah. Um, Dred, good evening. Good evening. Hello. Your Hi. professional name is Dred Scott, but at birth your parents gave you a different name. Yeah. Yeah. My parents named me Scott Tyler, and I chose the name Dred Scott um, because there was a historic figure uh, who was an enslaved man, and he got taken to a territory that had slavery outlawed in the United States. And in 1857, after he sued in a lower court, it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that there were no rights that a black person has that a white man is bound to respect. That's almost a verbatim quote from uh, the, the ruling. And it's a tremendous argument for white supremacy that is rooted within the US Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and US and, and British custom up until that point. Mm. And so when I took the name, I wanted to have people have to confront um, sort of US history. And, and, and while clearly chattel slavery has been outlawed in the United States, um, the sort of the white supremacy that was at the core of the, the Dred Scott Supreme Court decision is still sort of a governing and ruling uh, concept and idea in, mm -hmm. in the society. And so by making this your professional name, you're honoring his legacy. Yes, yes. Oh. And there's other, other reasons too. I mean, I, you know, since my name was Scott and I had dreadlocks at the time, I also took it because all the dreads I knew were Jimmy yeah. Dredd or Steve <laughs> Dredd. So I was like, hey, I'll be Dred Scott. That's perfect. <laughs> and of course it was D-R-E-D. -E you added an A. Yes, I added an A. Um, the spelling also uh, references the concepts of fear, but also, even though I'm an atheist, the Rasta concept of dread. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I, there were lots of conceptual or puns or, or reasons for doing it, but it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's look at uh, um, uh, photo number eight. This is uh, one of your earliest works, Dread, called What is the Proper Way to Display the U.S. Flag? And this uh, led to an enormous controversy. Uh, speaking of the Supreme Court, this went all the way to the Supreme Court. Can you tell us briefly uh, the story about this work and what then happened? Yeah. Um, well, it was an artwork when I, I made when I was 23 years old. It was an installation for audience participation. It was interactive. And an audience could see the photo montage that's on the wall, which has pictures of South Korean students burning American flags, holding signs that's a Yankee go home son of a bitch. Below that was a photograph of um, uh, troops coming back from Vietnam in coffins and it covered in flags. And there was the text that says, what's the proper way to display a U.S. flag? People could write responses to that question. And as they did so, they had the option of standing on a, a three by five foot American flag that mm, was on the floor. Not really an option. Well, it, it was an option, actually. It was actually really easy to stand by the side, which actually I think was one of the, the things that was so powerful and potentially controversial around the work was that though people, one direct method was to walk right up on the flag, you could choose not to. And yet many people chose to stand on the flag and many of the comments in the book reflect that in American society, there are lots of people who feel victimized by this society, who know the history of it, I mean, people whose brothers had been killed by the police wrote that they were happy for the opportunity to stand on the flag because the police killed their brothers and and then literally went over and kicked over their brother's body to make sure the inn was dead and then said, well, that cop was wearing a flag on his arm. And so they felt that this was sort of a very fitting way to display the flag and that people needed to grapple with and engage with mm -hmm, that history. Mm -hmm. What was this, this was also about, we talked about this uh, 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 before, uh, uh, beforehand, is the, the extreme reverence that Americans have for symbols yes. like this. And I wanted to mention this also because, uh, Patricia, I think about 10 years ago, you made a work using the Dutch national anthem, the yeah. Wilhelmus. Yeah, yeah. And you put a group of, uh, a very diverse group of people 
on the beach. Well, and there were all uh, there were all people who were um, uh, migrants from the former co Dutch colonies. Aha, uh -huh, all of them. Ah. Yeah, uh, I did that deliberately, and um, I placed them uh, in the sea. And it was uh, a particular uh, place where, during the 17th century, a lot of sea battles between uh, uh, colonial powers took place between, for example, between the Dutch and and and, uh, and the English. And um, we in the Netherlands, we only sing two parts of the national anthem, but it officially nobody knows the rest. No, <laughs> it officially consists of 15 parts, and it's. Um, it's a terrible song to sing, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> 15 parts. It's it's really difficult, um, but um, the whole story is actually uh, about um, uh, the founding father William of Orange, uh -huh. you know, and his uh, political conflict, but also his religion conflict. Um, and it's quite an interesting text if you analyze it. But it, of course, gets a very different uh, connotation when you have people from the former colonies uh, singing the national anthem mm. on this mm. particular spot. Mm -hmm. Do you think in the Netherlands, if uh, you had made a work like this flag work that Dredd made, that there would have been the same sort of controversy that there was in the U.S.? Um, I don't think so. Because um, there, you know, you should, every time when you watch an American movie, it doesn't matter which movie, you will always somewhere see an American flag. Oh, really? <laughs> I, really. I really thought, like, you know, I should make a, uh, a video out of it. You know, take all, yeah. cut yeah. all these, yeah. these parts out and paste them together and show this nationalism of the um, Americans. We don't have that in the Netherlands. No, it's different. No, not no. this kind, no, of, I'm, this I'm kind not so of nationalism. Sure. I'm not so sure. I think maybe... Five years ago, that would have been the case. But recently, I think with the uptick of... And we, we now even have the Dutch flag in our uh, chamber, uh, the second chamber in our parliament, which was never the case. And it's now standing behind the, land, uh, the, the desk. So I think mm. my, right now, if you would do it, I think there could be a backlash Maybe, because yeah. there is a really increased nationalism okay. in Dutch politics. Um, Dred, tell us about what actually happened mm. back then. Yeah. This, this, actually, this went ballistic. Yeah, I will. But I do want to mention one thing. You talked about how the Dutch national anthem has other stanzas that people don't know. The the Star Spangled Banner, the U.S. national anthem, does too. And in in their words, there's nothing could save the hireling or slave. And it's the the uh, the author was basically thinking it would be terrible if um, you know the U.S. didn't win to be able to maintain slavery. And that's a verse people don't don't know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so funny when, thing. When, when what is the proper way to display a U.S. flag was shown when I was an undergraduate student at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago in 1989, it became the center of controversy. It had been the work had been shown before, but when it was shown at the school, it um, there were various veterans groups who, in part because they were trying to create public opinion for a Supreme Court flag burning case that was about to go to the Supreme Court in 1989 from a flag burning that happened in 1984. Um, they demanded that the school remove the work, and the school, for various complicated reasons, didn't. Um, and so for weeks on end, it was running battles of people demanding that the work be removed. There were bomb threats phoned into the school. There were death threats that I received. Um, there were packages with ticking uh, alarm clocks that were in them. There were, wow. um, And there were demonstrations of uh, reactionary veterans groups, almost all of them all white, almost all of them from World War II and the Korean War, the Vietnam vets really weren't there. And they chanted things like the flag and the artist hang them both high, evoking images of lynching. Um, the work with, yeah, I, I mean, it was, a, it was a lynch mob. And um, and there were counter demonstrations. There were a lot of people who supported what I was doing and, and people would come to stand in line for an hour to see the, the artwork. But then through the the battles that were happening there, there were the, and, uh, complex history that I'm going to reduce to some sound bites, but basically the the Supreme Court case from, from the flag burning in 84, the the that was ruled that it was protected speech. It was free speech. The First Amendment protected it. So the federal government passed legislation to try and overturn that Supreme Court case ruling. 
And in doing that, they included wording that would explicitly and directly have outlawed what is the proper way to display a U.S. flag. And they cited it when they passed the legislation as they needed to have that wording to make sure this work wasn't seen. And then so as soon as that law went into effect, I and others and, and bef right around that time, the uh, president of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush one called the work disgraceful, which as an undergraduate art student, I thought was a tremendous honor that the president <laughs> of the United States knew I existed and he didn't like what my work was. I figured that was my job and that's what I needed to do for the rest of my life. Um, and so, but then we had to defy this law because it was a law that basically made patriotism compulsory. And so I and others burned flags on the steps of the Capitol um, and that went to the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court was forced through a tremendous political battle to actually recognize that indeed that uh, they would have to tear up their First Amendment and tear up their concept of freedom of speech in order to put us in jail, which is what they were trying to do. And so they they had to back down. And so now people can make art with the flag, they can burn flags, they can fly it on a pole, they can blow their nose in it. Um, often people are still arrested for burning the American flag, um, but but it is but they when when it goes to court they they win. Well. You got off. You uh, got off to quite a start, Dred, in your career as an artist. Yeah. Everybody should do that. <laughs> <laughs> you knew for sure that this was what you were going to do the rest of your life. Let's move yeah, on yeah. to the work that you showed at uh, Kunstalkade. That's uh, yeah. video number seven. I love that last so, moment where, where we see the woman look at the camera and say, yes, we did it. <laughs> okay, so yeah. what are we looking at? So what you're looking at is a couple video clips from a community-engaged performance called Slave Rebellion Reenactment. And I'll describe that in a second, but I just want to say that the word that she was saying towards the end, ashe, ashe, it's a Yoruba word that means the power to make things happen. And so this was a reenactment of the largest rebellion of enslaved people in the U.S. history. Um, it was a rebellion that happened in 1811, where 500 enslaved people were trying to seize all of Orleans territory, which is modern day Louisiana, and set up an African republic in the New World, which would have outlawed slavery. It was the boldest vision of freedom that was in the United States at the time. But this, rebellion, but this rebellion has been completely forgotten. How is yeah, that possible? Yeah, it's, well, it's erased from history in part because from the moment it happened, it shook society, U.S. society, to its foundations. Mm -hmm. And the people who ran this country didn't want people, particularly the enslaved, but also other people, to think that there was major slave rebellion. So the history from when it was first written basically downplayed the significance of it. And it wasn't until very recently, in, the, in literally 1995, that a, a much more authoritative history that looked at this from the perspective of the enslaved, that anybody really understood the significance of what happened and that it could have succeeded. And so I and 350 people, mostly black or black and indigenous people reenacted this history um, on the outskirts of New Orleans where this uprising took place. Yeah. I was and so, I was, let me just uh, uh, ask you, I was so surprised that you use the medium of a reenactment because I had yeah. heard of reenactments before and either they were sort of kooky fairy tale uh, gothic people or fairy fairyland people or they yeah. were uh, civil war buffs who were reenacting yeah. the battles where um, the uh, uh, usually the confederates were the winners yeah. so why reenactment dread um well as an artist, and often being a conceptual artist or community-engaged work, I'm really thinking of ways to look at how 
history sort of sets the stage for the present, but exists in the present in new form. What can we learn from history and how does it, what can it teach us about going forward? And a reenactment was a way to both challenge what the history of reenactment is. And in the U.S., you're right, the main form of reenactment is reenacting the Civil War. It's a Southern tradition and it's a, carried out by people who think the South were the good guys and wanted the, in, the enslaving society to continue unchallenged. And they basically want to bring back and strengthen white supremacy. And so by doing that, this challenges that. But more than that, it was an opportunity to utilize this history, this buried history, where the, the radical idea of freedom, far more radical than than Thomas Jefferson or, or, or um, John George Adams. Washington, who were themselves enslaved, or John Adams. Um, you know, who was not a slave owner, are, by the way. Yeah. These people had this idea that the problem with that society could not be solved unless you got rid of slavery, and they were going to take up arms to do so. And that... If, if your vision of freedom as embodied in the U.S. Constitution is predicated upon owning human beings, it's not really a profound vision of freedom. Whereas these enslaved actually saw, well, in order to get free, you have to end the institution of slavery. And the only way they could do that was to be seized territory. That wasn't going to be a lobbying effort. They weren't going to form a super PAC. They weren't going to you know, negotiate slavery away. It had to be overthrown. And so doing a reenactment could actually center the voices and ideas of the oppressed, in this case, Africans and Afro-descendant people, and do it in a way that with a lot of traditional reenactment, they try and do it like in a field so that you excise all the modern. And I was really interested in having this army of the enslaved marching for 24 miles over the course of two days past oil refineries and gated communities and trailer parks so this, this clash of the past and the present actually emphasizing that this is an unresolved question and that you have these people in, in 19th century French colonial garments, but that they're marching past cars and oil refineries and, and you know, gated communities. And so that's why reenactment as wielded in the hands of an artist could challenge how people understood this history, could bring it so people could embody this, so the reenactors could embody it but also that people engaging it could kind of see and experience how this is resonant and has as, as meaning for us today, including that the people that were embodying the, the, the freedom fighters, the enslaved, they, had, they were the agents of change. They were self-determined. They actually were the people to look to. And so what does that mean for people both doing that as reenactment, but also the observers? And so when people were chanting, you know, freedom, ashe, ashe, liberté, inside a major metropolitan American city in, in 2019, sort of, it was a harbinger of all that happened after the murder of George Floyd by the police. Mm, yeah. mm. How did the bystanders react? It varied. I mean, there were, by and large, people supported it. I mean, the, the, the America, is, as, as Robert has pointed out, is a complex, complicated society. And in that particular region, there are, are both the, class and racial divisions, part of where we were was literally Klan country. There were white supremacists who flew the Confederate flag, the one that's on the General Lee car, the tank yeah. crashed here. But there, that is flying on some people's flagpoles as if it was the American flag. There are poor black communities that are living in trailers that are on locations that 150 years earlier were slave cabins. There are <clears throat> are black elected officials that are the city government in some of these parishes. There are gated communities, there are trailer parks. And so there were school children from elementary schools that came out and watched us and they were inspired and it was a teachable moment for them. There were pastors at local churches that had their, their congregation that came and they really participated and loved it. There were people who were seeing it that didn't know anything about it that just came by their doorstep and they were like, this is incredible. This is the land my family has had for generations and nobody ever does anything like this and we're really happy to see you. And then there were people who were challenged by it, including a lot and some white people, some of whom were challenged and provoked in a good way and others of whom were racist and they were very determined that this should not happen, that black people were frankly too uppity. How dare they talk about this past and we should just be happy with what white people have given us. And so, you know, it was, you know, there was a range of, of feelings, but for the most part, the ones that I take both were the majority, but the ones that were most inspiring were people who came up 
afterwards and said, this is the most amazing thing that they've ever seen, or the reenactors themselves. It was a very said, emotional experience important. for a lot yeah. of these people, you told yeah. them. Yeah. yeah, they said it was the most important thing they'd done in their lives. And, and you know, people crossed state lines to do it. People, you know, were, uh, you know, who had family members that were sharecroppers or, or, or were enslaved. Some people had family members that were part of the rebellion like 200 years earlier. It was tremendously emotional for them. And and so both for audience and reenactors and the reenactors were, it was partially for them as, as sort of a reenactment as an artwork. It is, the performers were also the audience in some capacity. And so, um, you know, it, it was something that was tremendously moving and resonant for them. And, and I think many of them have become kind of ambassadors for freedom in, in a new way in the, the modern era. You told me... Um my project, this project, the reenactment, is is about the aspirations to be free, and yeah. not about the terrible th things that white people did. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> how can how can you separate the two? Well, I mean, the thing is, I think that most people, if they think about it for just a second, know that slavery was a horror and that many white people did a lot of horrible things. They know that there was brutality during slavery. A lot of people don't think about it that much. And frankly, people should confront that more. But if you think about it for just a minute, you do know that people at a minimum were whipped and hung. And you probably, if you're honest, know that many, many women were raped. Um, I mean, I wear this on my skin, literally. Um, the, that, you know, in Africa, where my ancestors, many of my ancestors, or a section of my ancestors are from, they were much darker than this. Mm. And so, um, you know, it... It is something that people know was a terrible period, but that's, I mean, everybody kind of knows that. What people don't know is that these freedom fighters both were the agents and self-determined of change, but also that they had this profound, this radical view of freedom, that it was more radical than the, the freedom that we study when we're looking at the foundation and roots of democracy mm -hmm. and social change we actually get the story wrong in looking at what this project is. If you don't focus just, if you don't focus on enslavement, if you focus on freedom, you can actually get the story right because that's what was new here. This rebellion, even though it didn't succeed in seizing all of Orleans territory, the political aspiration, the organizing that was necessary, the clandestine organizing, this aspiration for liberation, that's what is a suppressed story. And I do think people should know about the horrors of slavery because you don't get the modern day America or modern day Europe without slavery. Everything that we're going through today with you know, even you know, toppling of monuments and George Floyd and police brutality has its roots in slavery. The wealth that was extracted and stolen you know, that laid the foundation for American dominance of the world is all slave traders money. That's what it is. And, um, you know, and the conception of democracy is rooted in a conception of freedom that is predicated upon owning people and about private property. It is an outmoded view. And that's what people are going on and on about. So the way I think yes. that if, if the, the way the project was constructed to not look at basically what did white people do, but to look at what did Africans and Afro-descendant people do, that is a way to sort of get into what the, the heart of the matter is and, and in a weird way, get into the truth, mm -hmm. um, which is not to say that we were not cognizant of what white people had done, but that's not the story here. And, that's, and, mm -hmm. and excavating this buried history is actually getting much deeper at the truth. Mm -hmm. Patricia. Well, I think um, what is important is to know is that from the first moment that the black people were kidnapped from the shores of Africa and transported to the Americas and the Caribbean, they revolted. They yes. were not like, you yes. know, uh, victims who uh, like black sheep, uh, poor black sheep, sort of like... Uh, uh, went into slavery. They revolted from the first moment, always. Uh, for centuries, and uh, I dare, and marunage, it comes from that, you know, the, the, the being maroons and creating this, those safe spaces yeah. where they um, uh, came together and uh, took care of their communities. Uh, so it's a very, very long tradition of um, uh, revolting, and I dare to say that the Black Life, Le Lives Matter movement comes from that tradition uh, yeah. uh, as well. 
but I am actually very curious also to Alexa um, and uh, what you have to say about uh, about this. I mean, I'm from Colombia, and Colombia housed the first palenques, which were the first liberated black spaces in South America. My grandmother is a black woman who raised me as my mother, you know, and so these stories are in and woven through us all. And I think, I mean, there's so much that you said, Dred, I feel like it would be to repeat. And, and there is what's beautiful about this moment in history is, and with the Black Lives Matter movement and what happened this summer and people even putting their own health aside, not knowing how coronavirus was yeah. gonna impact you as soon as you stepped outside. We'd all been indoors. Nobody knew how it transmuted, but people knew collectively. And that's the beauty of America too, is that folks were like, we're gonna go to the streets because honestly, yes, there's the dangers of this virus, but the pandemic of, of racism is, is, is even more real, not even equally, even more real. So we're gonna go to the streets. And, and that you saw a broad, base of folks hitting the streets and mostly led by young people, young people of color, which has always been the people it, it, historically who have made the change, who have pushed the boundaries. You know, those who are marginalized are in positions of, of stronghold. And it's really, it's, it's a mirror of nature, right? Like when you look at nature, it's where the ocean and the desert meet. It's where the forest and the sea meet, where you find the strongest biodiversity. And those are the marginalized sections, right? And that's, that's also happens in our human ecology, where we are marginalized, we are stronger, we see multiple views. And the young people have really brought it Forth, and it's, it's a beautiful time to be alive and to see these histories start to begin a process of healing through authentic um, witnessing of what has happened. No longer hiding behind, but mm -hmm. really seeing. Yeah. You said you and said, Dred, in a in an interview that uh, in the past forty years, the conversation about this has not been as uh, lively, as alive and aware as it is now. Yeah. I mean, you know, when the sixties wound down in the early seventies, that was sort of between then and, and this June, really, you know, May, June, the conversation had been bu bubbling and percolating. I'd been part of demonstrations. I'd organized them. There'd been, you know, particularly after Mike Brown was killed, there's been, you know, upheaval. But what happened this May and June and into July was profound. I mean, there were people all over this country demanding that, you know, an end to systemic racism, including white people in small towns that they'd never even seen a black person. <laughs> and yet they were out in the street saying, no, we want change. And and it was led, as Alexa pointed out, by a lot of young people and other young black women, to be to be really straightforward and blunt, that, that and and it was really important and, and it's inspiring. I mean, the, you know, people, the, you know, the fact that people didn't know how that their health would be affected by this, but we knew that continuing to allow the police to murder us and all the other aspects of what this system does to black people, that was going to kill us even if, and, and COVID was ironically part of that, that black people were dying at disproportionate numbers, tremendously disproportionate numbers and getting sick at tremendously disproportionate numbers and being forced into factories that, that there were not health and safety precautions taken or forced into hospitals as hospital workers, not the doctors, but the orderlies without protective gear. Mm, mm. And so all this upheaval was, it was both self-preservation, but it was a profound challenging and radical of, we are not yeah. going to go back. Yeah. We are not taking this anymore. We are not asking, we are demanding change. And it did bring in all swaths of society. It wasn't just black people, but mm. black people stepped forward. And a lot of people in part because they were at home with nothing to do when they couldn't get out. It was like, yeah. oh, let me do some learning because this is what's needed right now. Yeah. I'm and curious to hear from uh, from Robert what he saw as he traveled all the way across the country and back again. You've seen a cross section of, uh, of this all over the US. Yes, but not so much. Of course, I know that uh, Black Lives Matter existed and, and, and sometimes we touched on the subject, but of course what happened after Joyce Floyd was in 2020 mm -hmm. and I traveled in 2019. Mm -hmm. But what you sensed uh, is that uh, uh, everybody was still more on edge. And so there was inevitable that something like George Floyd, and you didn't know when it would happen, but that it would evoke this whole mass protest because 
people were so fed up. Um, because so, when we opened the exhibition, that was in February, and the murder of George Floyd was in March, and people came up to me and said, oh, it's so good that you're doing this exhibition now of, because of George Floyd. I said, it's not about... I mean, first of all, we took a couple of years to do this exhibition, but also, um, this is not something from now. It already started in 2013 under Obama. That was when Black Lives Matter was founded. So it's not something of 2020. It's already there and it's building and building. And in the exhibition, This is America, um, in the first room, I coupled the work of Dredd together with the work of uh, the photographer Sheila Bree Bright. And she took pictures of uh, the first Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations in Ferguson and Baltimore, but she also took pictures of the civil rights leaders in Atlanta from the 60s, but now. This was a couple of years ago, but so it's um, all men and women, and she printed those uh, pictures and put them on the, ha on the buildings that they used to congregate. And in the exhibition, I combined those two series next above each other, and on the other side is Dredd's uh, uh, reenactment. So it's this whole weavement of history of protest within the black community, but also to signify that 50 years ago uh, the civil rights movement came a long way. But somehow, still after 50 years, it was still necessary to go to the streets and fight for the same basic rights. So within 50 years, maybe not that much changed. I'm not sure if I can say that bluntly. I mean, I'm looking at the American artists and they know better. Uh, but I think that signifies part of that room, that history repeats itself, but it's also necessary to repeat the history. Mm -hmm. Dred, you told me that your, uh, your father, no, your uncle from Chicago, went to the South in the 60s to uh, uh, help voters get their rights to vote, to fight voter repression. Uh, and he knew that he was risking his life. Yeah. So yeah. this I mean, for you I, has, this history has a, a, a profound link very close to yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, but, I mean, so I had an uncle who was a lawyer and helped do voter registration for black people in the South in the, the early 1960s. And he knew that he was, he could potentially get killed for doing that as, as some people did. And, you know, the fact that that now even right wing Republicans are actually telling the president, please tone down the rhetoric because some of your supporters who are fascists and militants and militias are potent are threatening our lives. And, mm -hmm. and I think that so the question of even voter registration and voter rights is still something that's very much with us. And I think that, as Robert was pointing out, you know, the, it is a situation where things haven't changed all that much. I mean, it's like there there is a larger black middle class now than in 1966 or something like that. But outside of that, on every measurable statistic in terms of wealth, life expectancy, income, health outcomes, health. anything, you know, levels of black people within upper management and CEOs, it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the thing is this is America. This is not a, a minor... <laughs> problem that just cropped up that can be fixed. You look at mass incarceration, there are 2.3 million people in prison, yeah. 1.1 yeah. million are yeah. black. Um, this is not a design flaw. This is, the, this is what America is. Mm -hmm. And until you get rid of that, you're going to have this profound systemic entrenched racism. Let's look at uh, another systemic trait of American society, um, gun violence. Could we have uh, videos 13 and 14 back to back, please? By Alexa Garcia. I had different ideas for like what the background could be and landed on the galaxy because they're heroes even beyond, even in the other realm, even for those who have passed. And in the process of creating this, I was like, how can I face an image? How can I create an image that's joyful? And, uh, and at the same time, um, is bringing me comfort as an artist when dealing with the face of this pandemic. It's a way to like counterbalance almost my own fear. <laughs> I love that little giggle at the end, uh, Alexa. <laughs> this is Times Square. 
this animation. Yeah, that, that, wow. This piece is not the one about gun violence. This is uh, in response no. to COVID and who are the people in the forefront and who are we honoring? Um, and yes. it was an interesting and most amazing moment. Uh, I've been living in New York City for 17 years and I literally the week that the image went up in Times Square, I was leaving in New York for an indefinite amount of time. And I was like, wow, this is an incredible way to leave this city <laughs> with my uh, art up on Times Square. <laughs> Let's just have a um, quick look at picture been... number 12. It's a great picture yeah. of you, Alexa, on Times Square in front of this uh, oh. this beautiful work. You look like a, like a I don't know, <laughs> a dancer. Well, you are a dancer. You are a performer. performer yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see you perform before we go any further. Could we look at uh, video number 16, please? You are such a multi-talent. <laughs> I wonder if the sun debates dawn some mornings Not wanting to rise out of bed from under that down feather horizon if the sky grows tired of being everywhere at once Adapting to the mood swings of the weather If clouds drift off trying to hold themselves together Make deals with gravity to loiter a little longer I wonder if rain is scared of falling If she has trouble letting go If snowflakes get sick of being perfect all the time each one trying to be you know come on now <laughs> one of a kind beautiful beautiful yeah. beautiful your spoken word performance um yeah. uh so you did address uh the corona crisis with this fabulous animation on times square what a what a place to to perform and you did that together with four freedoms um, yes. Could you could you tell us about Four Freedoms? Um, well, the Four Freedoms Collective is, is is a nice collection, a beautiful collection of people. Uh, it was started by Hank Willis Thomas, Thomas and Eric Goldsman, and Four Freedoms is an artist led organization that is really modeling and increasing creative civic engagement and discourse and direct action. Um, and and this was one of many projects, uh, and yeah, <laughs> there's so much to say, but in short, that's a good one. And you can look them up for freedoms.com. Yeah, they were very hour. active also in the elections, uh, Robert. You saw uh, the billboard project? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I included them. And what it signifies for me is also, uh, because we not only had Four Freedoms, but you had all, we also had Amplifier, we had Artists for Democracy, we had the campaigns that Mark Trentwist um, uh, la launched. So a lot of artists in the U.S., make billboards, posters, pamphlets, manifest, and distribute them on the street. So that's something that's really important, that artists engage in getting that message across. And I think Four Freedoms is a huge platform with huge billboards in all the 50 states. Like in Georgia, looking at uh, uh, photograph number 15, that's a, a huge uh, Four Freedoms billboard in Georgia, which of course now is the hotbed of uh, the Absolutely. coming elections for the Senate. Yeah. On January 5th. And I think a lot of, uh, some of those messages are about uh, social issues, but some of those messages are also basically get out and vote. And if you look at the elections, Biden won because of Detroit, Philadelphia and Atlanta. That's why he's president. And it's people on the ground, uh, Stacey Adams, of course, but also artist groups and other grass le um, grassroots level groups that really got people out to vote. And that was so important. And it's pivotal, pivotal, um, that's a good word, I hope, uh, for, the, for the election of Biden. So, uh, and it's not to say that artists made him elected, but it's, they're part of this whole group. Mm. And I think artists had a, a really important part in that yeah. campaign. Yeah. Let's get back to uh, uh, the issue we were just going to look at, um, images 10 and 11. The work that Alexa made, which uh, was on view in uh, Kunstalkade. These are school children, Alexa. Who are they? Yes. So this is an eight foot tall by 31 foot pencil drawing. 
Um, and 89 portraits so far I've drawn of children under the age of 12 who've been killed by guns in the United States between 2012 and 2013, which is the year that gun violence went up in the United States and it has yet to come back down. And I, by the time the project is done, I will have drawn some 120 out of the 194 portraits. Um, but it's been a very deep process. I've been working on this piece for seven years now. Mm. Uh, in between tour stops, whenever I get home, wherever I am, I roll a little bit out and, and work on it. And it's really incredible to see this piece enter the world and enter the outside of whatever room or whatever wall I've been working on. You know, so much of, about being a creator is making invisible, what is invisible, visible. And also creativity is the antidote to destruction. So the process of working on this piece and also choosing to do it on paper, you know, paper and pencil, something so fragile that can rip so easily is part of the deeper metaphor of this piece itself. Um, the, the piece has survived a fire. I had a house fire. I had a flood. It survived a flood. So there's this energy of these children that I've been carrying and who've been carrying me as well, you know, and, and they're, they're ever present. Um, and I think that there, so much death is happening right now. We're in, in the heart of a mass extinction. 145 to 200 species are going extinct every single day. You add on top of that the human death given COVID and everything. And I feel like the veils are very thin right now mm. between this world and that world. And it's an incredible opportunity. Like Arundhati Roy said, it, we're entering a portal. And I would add it is a portal towards the imaginal. And I feel like the fact that this piece this year, even though I've been working on for seven years has made its way into the collective consciousness. It was in, at MOCA in LA and now it's in the Netherlands um, when I haven't even had an, a proper solo art exhibit in my life. Most people don't even know I draw. Like I did some, <laughs> I, I'm a performer and people know I'm a musician and people know I do film, but my visual art, even though it's my first love, it's something that I've definitely kept um, in, in whatever room I've been inside of. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this year, these modalities are forcing themselves out there, even beyond my own push or, or control or anything. Um, and, and I think working with, with the dead in a way, uh, in, in this time of such transition and of such transformation of such unknown is, is really doing it. Like uncertainty is what is now. And uncertainty is permanent now. Um, and, did, did you get any yeah. responses from family members or parents? No, no, not yet. Mm. And I'm wondering mm. when that will happen. Mm. I do. And did, did, that, that was a question I had when I looked at the drawing. You have to research all those children. Yeah. It's not like their pictures were in, in, in newspapers. Some of them will have been. But you really have to research all those images. Yes, I, I do, I, I've done a lot of research throughout the years. I've compiled for months on end. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it's an interesting dance. It, there was a time where I was really looking into how these young people died or what took their life. And it became so intense to hold all of these stories. One of the young children, actually two of them, they're, they're siblings, and they were killed by their father. And that was the last time that I was like, you know what, I can't keep taking on these stories because as I was drawing them, one thing, one of my techniques is to draw the whole face, draw the lips, draw the nose, draw this, and then do the eyes at the very end. And these two brothers felt so close to me. Actually, it's the one I'm working on right there in that picture, those two brothers right there. I decided to draw the eyes first and the spirit of of one of these children really entered the space. And I had to do a lot of work, like a lot of clearing and communicating with the spirit that was like, hi. And I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> right. um, and and I, they became almost like a gateway. This child, these two children became almost a gateway to the, the energy and the spirit of all the other ones. And it was really when we sat, like really sitting in circle with, the, with this energy that I feel like the project blossomed into what it is now and even that we're sitting here talking about it because we all entered a collective space of like okay this this is an important topic this is an important issue and we are going to address this together and what, what i found interesting is that 
when I look these people at the drawing, um, the fact that they're in a school situation, which is the um, kind of the start of their lives and where they will prosper and where they get all the so they're the all these young lives broken on that moment uh, and and I think that's that's something that's really strong that you choose yeah. school setting uh, as the place where people can grow um, and was taken yeah. The piece is called Who's Next Up in Arms, which obviously has a number of double entendres. And um, it was really inspired. Uh, inspired feels like an interesting word, but I was moved by what happened in Sandy Hook. I couldn't believe it. And it was my way to really start processing that. I was like, wait, really? That's where gun violence has gone to in this country? Um, and so having them in this classroom and having them together and you know, I tried to put the same ages together. There's something very comforting for me to have the toddlers, for example, cuddled up in, in, in one section or the teenagers in another. And there's almost this energy of support that's happening between them in, in this frozen moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. A very Sadening. strong piece. Yeah, a very yeah. strong piece. Very touching yeah. also. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, but when, let's, yeah, Alexa? I just, yeah, this is one thing I wanted to say. Part of this piece, and right here, is just up in, in this horizontal way. But when I did it at MOCA, it was a full installation. And you walked into and you engaged with. There's an audio element where you hear meditative music and you hear intersplice with news clippings of, of these that's losses. Also in a, that but was also an exhibition. Yeah, but and when you enter in the installation, there is an opportunity for you to leave, to write a note for somebody who has lost somebody to gun violence and to take one of the pencils. I laid out 194 pencils to represent the 194 children that, that year. And you take one of those pencils and write a note. And part of the exhibition for me too is also for me to be their live drawing. So as this process was happening, I would see so many people come in and sit down and kneel. The most consistent response was for people to be on their knees and looking up and leaving notes for those who have survived um, family members who, who have been killed by gun violence and then leave this note as they exited. And, and then for those who've experienced that kind of loss, they could take one of these notes with them. And the level of tears and healing and conversations that happened in that process is also a continuation of that healing. Mm -hmm. So that's where art becomes very powerful too. It, it breaks, and I think some of what Jed was talking, like when you break um, that fourth wall and you enter the performance and the engagement and the participation and the, and the witnessing all, all in one. There's something very magical that gets conjured up in that. Beautifully said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Patricia, in your work, which is now on view, uh, well, will be again on view when the museum reopens after yeah. lockdown in uh, Maastricht, in yeah. the Bonnefonte, you have a, a work called The Soul of Salt, and you also invite visitors to engage with that. Mm -hmm. Can we see pictures number 17 and 18? This is the salt, <laughs> yeah. a huge pile of salt. Yeah. Yeah. And you invite visitors, as in image number 18, to take a, a spoon and a bag and take some of the salt with them. What's the story of the salt? Uh, it's derived from a, a Caribbean legend, which, uh, which tells that enslaved people refrained from eating salt because they thought they would become lighter and fly back to Africa. But for me, it also stands by, symbol. By not eating salt, yeah. they would become lighter and fly back to Africa. Yeah. Ah. yeah. But uh, for me, it also stands symbol for all the tears that have been uh, shed during slavery and colonialism. Uh, but it's also... Um, uh, another part is also that it shows the power of imagination. Because... Uh, you know, uh, you can your body can be kept uh, captive, uh, but you in in your mind you can always think yourself free. You can liberate yourself. So it was for me also. Um, I always I also always uh, have the soul piece um, related to a contemporary story. That I find it very important to contextualize it in a contemporary story. So two years ago I had a, a the soul pile placed uh, at the Manifesta a biennial in Palermo. Uh, Palermo is situated uh, the Mediterranean. 
So we have a huge humanitarian crisis around uh, refugees who are drowning in that Mediterranean, as we speak, more than 35 bodies already. Um, and most of those people come from sub-Saharan countries. So I took the salt from the Mediterranean and placed it in a, a palazzo facing the, the same Mediterranean and invited uh, refugees who, um, you know, who managed to get uh, ashore to sing a 19th century slave song. And uh, the song is called Many Thousand Gone. And um, the salt is also blessed by a Winti priest, and Winti is a nature religion from Suriname. And after the blessing, people can take some of the salt home, uh, dissolve it in water as a symbol of solving the pain of the past. But actually, you know, uh, digging together in the mountain also stands symbol of digging a path into the future together. Ah. And um, trying, yeah, it's a form of healing also. Also what Elixa is doing, Elixa I think is, art yeah. is very important. You can, art can be very important in, in a healing process because we're all suffering from the colonial wound. Let's ask Dread. Dread is the enactment before, for example, is that part of a healing process? Can that help healing? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think Patricia is very, it's really great to point that out. I mean, I, th you know, I look at healing, not just in terms of healing trauma in a, an abstract sense, but actually, if the knife is still in our back, then we can't heal, but actually ending the situation that's continuing to cause the trauma is actually part of healing and giving people the ability to fight back in some ways, even if it's with art, is actually an important part of the healing. A lot of the people that were participants on the reenactment, very of them were practitioners of traditional African religions. And many of them felt that they could feel the ancestors that a burden, that the ancestors were with us and that this was a way to reconnect with the ancestors. As an atheist, I don't view things that way, but I feel very much that in a society where the police can just walk into your home and murder you, could stand outside your home and shoot into your home and murder you, and the, the lawsuit will be about whether or not the white people in the house next door, um, actually, whether there, there was, whether they, they had rights, but the woman, Breonna Taylor, who was Breonna killed Taylor. by the police, yeah. had no rights. They, she had less rights than the wallpaper. Um, and so if we don't actually solve the today, there, there is no healing, so I think that the, the artwork that addresses the past but enables people to really sort of talk about how we get free now is profoundly healing. And in this case, I mean, you saw it in the sense where people were chanting, Ashe, Ashe, Liberté, Liberté. That was tremendous joy. I mean, this was profound black joy and, and, and celebration. It was not about suffering. It was People were very healed after this two-day march. Mm. Could you yeah. compare that, that phrase to man, a mantla in South Africa? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I got some of my political eye teeth cut kind of on the, the, the <laughs> South African uh, you know, anti-apartheid movement. It was very inspiring to, you know, look at and learn from Steve Biko and, and, and the broader anti-apartheid movement. And so Amandla way too, you know, was sort of on my lips as a, as a youth. And I think that, you know, the, the toy toy, you know, the dance in South Africa where people were you know, honoring the dead, but fighting back in, a, in their funerals, um, you know, was something that you know, is part of my makeup. And, and mm. so, yeah, I, I think that that, yeah. that Amandla is mm -hmm. an appropriate uh, part of reference. the Part of the uh, project, the SALT project, uh, Patricia, was a video that you made together yeah. with uh, Quincy Gario. Yeah. Uh, called With a Rather Beautiful. Maybe you can explain the title mm. after we've seen it. Could we have video number 19? As we think about the salt, we hear the stories of the ones who flew away, the stories of the ones who told us that this was not their place. We hear the absences in their presences. We hear the presences in the absolute understanding of that they were fleeing. We we're fleeing. We have fled and found our way towards peaceful pastures. We have fled and flew and are the refugees of time. Beyond the contraptions of old towards the understandings of 
the waves. Are you listening? Have you heard the stories? Yes, we're listening. <laughs> <laughs> do these do these waves have the same significance as in your project with the national anthem, the Wilhelmus? Yes. Um, let me first tell you a little bit about the salt piece, which is now in the Bonavante Museum, because it's related to Quincy. That salt comes from the salt plains of Bonaire. Mm -hmm. And Bonaire is one of the colonized islands of the Netherlands. And actually the, the Dutch Antilles. Right? Dutch Antilles. And um, actually the Dutch are, still, are, are behaving really badly there. The Dutch government, they are kind of like recolonizing the island. A lot of people are suffering from COVID-19. Uh, are, there's a lot of inequality, a lot of poverty. So I uh, chose um, uh, to have the salt from the salt plains from Bonaire. There is an American uh, company, Cargill, who owns the salt plains. And for the local people, it's a very important historical place because a lot of enslaved people suffered there during slavery. Uh, and also, you know, keep in mind that without salt, no slavery. Uh, so salt was really, really important during slavery. People suffered there during uh, the uh, slavery, and uh, for many people, in local people, it's a very important area. But they're not allowed to go there in that area only to work on very poor wages, low wages for this American company. So I managed to get the salt from the salt plains. Uh, and got it into the museum. It's not a small amount of salt. <laughs> it's a large amount of salt, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I also wanted to have the Bonarian people from uh, who are living in the Netherlands. I uh, wanted, uh, I invited him into the museum to do a ritual around the salt, uh, and they also could take some of the salt home. And that's a very emotional thing for them because they cannot get to mm. the salt. They yeah. cannot... Um, so it was for the first time that they had salt from their home country. And I invited Quincy, who is a, a wonderful artist, but also an incredible spoken word artist, as you can see, because he's, he is improvising in the moment. Oh, really? Really. Um, so, uh, and he is from St. Martin and from Curaçao. He also did research on salt, and I said, should we collaborate in this? Because I am not from that area. And I thought, like, you know, I'm not in a proper position. It's not my position to, to, to take that story and do something with it, you know. I have to do something with the community. I can facilitate. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, I, I felt that I had to You're take a step there. there. Yeah. So he... And what we did is we took spaces. All the, uh, the whole film is around about 10 minutes. And all the locations are, of course, historical locations. And it's in Zeeland, in Middelburg. And that's where the headquarters of the VOC, the Dutch uh, Eastern Company, was situated. And this particular space is where a ship um, uh, sank uh, in 1783. Uh, and it was filled with uh, cowrie shells, which they had taken from mm -hmm. the Maldives. And the cowrie shells were used to buy bodies. For 20,000 cowrie shells, you could buy a body. So up until today, you will find cowrie shells in front of that shore. Mm. And we took, um, and there is another story in 1569, also in Middelburg. Um, a ship entered uh, the city with 30 enslaved people. But slavery officially didn't, uh, was not allowed in the Netherlands. So there was a very complex situation because you have these enslaved people... Um, they had to uh, uh, go uh, uh, off the ship and uh, enter the country, but slavery didn't exist, so officially they were free. But then, of course, there was a lot of loss of profit. So the captain, this sounds like a really interesting reenactment. So the captain went to the high court because in, officially they were free, but then the captain went to the high court, and then he was allowed to bring them back into the ship again, and then they, they vanished. Nobody knew what happened. There, there's no record of what mm. happened to them. So we took all these historical places in that city and had this spoken word uh, performed by Quincy. And he is, of course, responding in the spoken word to what happened in that city. Yeah. 
And the title, With a Rather Beautiful? With a Rather Beautiful comes from um, uh, uh, a poem. It's from a poem uh, from uh, St. Martin. Ah. And he took one of the centers of the poem. And the poem in itself is also about um, uh, slavery and the history of uh, St. Martin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have a couple questions for all of you to, uh, as we uh, move towards the end of our session together. Um, Patricia, could you address the difference in the artistic culture and the, perhaps the outspokenness and the political engagement in uh, the differences between the U.S. and the Netherlands? Um, the, 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 the U.S. have um, a very long uh, and rich uh, tradition um, intellectually, uh, but also visually and in the arts. Um, for example, the Harlem Renaissance has been very important. So there is um, a very long tradition uh, of a discourse and of a, of a non-white discourse also. Um, uh, in the Netherlands, if we look at the black community, which I think we do not really have a black community because we come from different geographies. Uh, and we have different historical backgrounds and we are all uh, immigrants. We were all immigrants. Our parents were immigrants. Uh, uh, and we have now uh, more generations of, of, of young black people. And I'm also a second generation who was uh, born here and who feel Dutch, but also feel related to the home country. But even the home country is not really your country because you were also imported in that country, your parents. So it is a very uh, complex colonial gap uh. in which we are um, as situated. If you compare it to the United States... The enslaved people were imported. They are, of course, migrants, but they have a long tradition of being in that country. Um, also, of course, a problematic tradition because the Native Americans were the, f the first ones sure. to live there, um, which is also a, a complex situation, uh, um, being in, uh, imported. But that's, uh, that's and, and slavery took place in the country itself. In the Netherlands, slavery didn't exist officially. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder so, how the um, yeah. has, how has um, and this is a question for all of you. How has the uh, rise blossoming of Black Lives Matter changed the context within which you work? All of you have been active in this field in this way long before the recent explosion of Black Lives Matter. But I think I would think that something has changed in these last months. Um, Perhaps first, Dred, you? Well, there's a show in Amersfoort that has yeah. black American artists. <laughs> I can really that, recommend I it. It <laughs> might not have existed were it not for... No, I mean, I, I think there's more interest in the kind of work that I've been doing for 30 years now than at any point in my life. And I ah. think that, um, you know, it, and it's not just me. I mean, it's there, there are a lot of artists that have been doing this kind of work and that suddenly... There is interest. Some of it had been building for three, four, five years, and some of it just sort of turned the corner this this you know June, July. Um, but I think that the, there there's a broader context within which the work can be discussed and understood, um, and then there's a, a, a easier collaboration and collaborative and spirit of dialogue with amongst a lot of the artists mm -hmm. who are both trying to deepen what we're doing and some of the engagement actually, including specifically, I think, thinking about questions of liberation and how we get free and how not just to depict the horrors of the trauma, but actually talk about how we get beyond this. And, and so I think that that is, the, the, there's been a, a much more you know, fruitful intellectual ferment mm. amongst artists and intellect, broad, you know, artists and writers. But then there has been the, the interest in the work that's been, it's, you know, it's, it's actually really important and in that it's also combined with a broader movement. I mean, because if, yeah. if it weren't for the people in the streets, the work we would do would still be interesting, but it wouldn't be nearly as, you know, it wouldn't herald the potential for change that exists. Yeah. That said, I, you know, I've lived in America my whole life and I've looked at its history and I, you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, there was a high point of struggle in the 60s, but not a lot changed since then and many mm. of these things have gotten worse. Mm. 
And so while I'm very, I think there's a lot of potential in this moment, I also look at the fact that 74 million people voted for a fascist who is outspokenly racist, loves, you know, hates women and is very enamored with a religious theocracy and, 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 and uh, as opposed to science. And that, that is actually very much defining and setting what's going on here. And as you talked about earlier, there's a rise in nationalism, you know, in the Netherlands, but also there's a rise in fascism around the world. Mm-hmm. You look at Hungary or Austria or, or Poland or, mm-hmm. uh, um, um, you know, parts of true, you know, Central true. America, Brazil. Yeah, but I think, I think we know. also should be critical on Biden. You know, uh, you know, Biden is seen as kind of like a savior. But please, you know, uh, (laughs) all things being relative. (laughs) I'm glad Trump lost the election, but Biden is an absolutely terrible. I mean, he's I described him in an essay as a a condescending racist with a well-known black friend. And I Mm -hmm. stick by that. (laughs) Uh, Alexa, what have you noticed? How the the, uh, any change in the context in which you work since the in the last, say, six months? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with what you said. I've been an artist and an organizer for 17, 18 years actively. And I feel like my work has always been looked at like, hmm, ahead of the time. Hmm, wait, what? And I feel like all of a sudden everything's catching up. Uh. Um, we put out a song called uh, We Rising Up or another one called Who Decides five, six years ago, seven years ago about Black Lives Matter, you know? And so that it's now just catching up. Patrice Cullors is a dear friend of ours. We were having these conversations in the kitchen, you know, and to see all this work blossoming and coming to this moment is inspiring. But just like you're saying, there is so much that needs to be done in the next four years. So that in four years or eight years, we don't elect another Trump. (laughs) And it's very, it, it easily could go in that direction because half of, pretty much half of, the people who voted voted white supremacist, anti-women, pro-religion, and that's terrifying. And so I think our work right now is is being called for, I think, by the collective in, in so many ways, because as humans, we consciously or unconsciously want to participate in our own rescue. And the truth of the matter is that we have maybe four or five years to shift the environmental tide if we're lucky, right? So when you put all these things together, I think as a human collective, we want to make change. And then there are those that want to keep their power and a lot is going to unfold in the next four or five years. Mm. And we're going to have to, like, we have our work cut out for us right now. And I think as artists, it is our role to inspire people and get into the heart of folks, not just into the data and the mental understanding of what's going on, but really Mm. get them inspired to Mm. activate. One of the works by Four Freedoms that was at the, on show at the museum in Amersfoort at the Kunsthal uh, had the text, Every Refugee Boat is a Mayflower. Mm. And uh, that really stayed with me. We want to yeah. work on our own rescue. Uh, Patricia, finally, could you address the impact of Black Lives Matter on the uh, Dutch art scene? Mm. Any? <laughs> well, um, what I see happening here in the Netherlands is... Um, that people are very easy um, and willingly to place the hashtag and uh, to have like a black square on social media, but not really, really uh, realizing that it is about systemic change. You know, we have a very long tradition of institutionalized racism here in the Netherlands, but also a very long tradition of denial about that racism. And it's only recently since we had the whole Black Pete discussion that the racism which always has been festering as a dirty wound under the skin and it's coming out now, which is on the one hand good because it becomes more and more more visible, but now we need to start to do the real work. And the real work is work of pain and discomfort. And what I still see in the Netherlands is that people find it extremely difficult to talk about race and to talk about um, the the system of race and to talk about the privileges and to talk about um, uh, whiteness and um, uh, the system of whiteness. Um, And as long as as, as, uh, those systems are not clarified, uh, it 
people are still seeking for cosmetic solutions. And those are not real and true solutions. And I see it happening in um, yeah, the cultural scene. I see it happening uh, in the art world. And, you know, what you were saying about all these all the artists the black artists who are and the activists who are working their work it's not that their work suddenly is um properly contextualized because of black matters you know if you are fighting for justice it's something that you do for the rest of your life you know you do it until you die uh and and then you pass it on to the next generation you know in the ubuntu philosophy they say that if an injustice is done, you need to set it straight, even if it takes a thousand years. And we have a, a justice system which says that after 12 years, you know, it's gone. You ha do not have to, to set it straight again. And we come from cultures where you need to fight until justice is done. So I hear uh, uh, both Dredd and Alexa saying uh, we have our work cut out for us. Mm -hmm. uh, a work of pain, as you said, Patricia, but I also heard Dredd say that there is now a new potential for change. So somewhere between those two poles, um, our well, future think, will unroll. I think one of the... the, the you, can, you can almost call it a compliment that there is now such a pushback from certain uh, political spheres, right-wing spheres, for the whole concept of Black Lives Matters. They question the whole fundamentals of it. And the fact that they que question it, I think, is that they are now forced to engage with it while they could, before this, ignore it. Uh, it's so strongly on the table that they need to engage. And of course they get angry and of course they want to push it off the table. But they know it's there and at a certain point they will have to address it. And I think that's the most important thing yeah. From my perspective, yeah. of course, well, I, I hope have that, a different perspective. I hope but that having this conversation uh, is a form of addressing this, both in the Netherlands mm -hmm. and in the U.S. with our speakers who joined us today. Thank you both so much, Dred Scott and Alexa Garcia. Thank you, Patricia Kaersenhout, for joining us. Thank you, Robert, for putting together this wonderful exhibition. Thank you. And I hope that all of you will join us again on January 6th, the day after these very important re-elections for the Senate. We will then know whether Biden, <laughs> well, he's not our savior, but it's better than what we had, um, uh, whether Biden will be able to get his legislation through the Senate. And later in January, we will be screening the new film about Martin Luther King and how the FBI was on his case all the time. Really interesting new film with a conversation also with the director and hopefully also with the author of the book. So keep an eye on our website and we'll publish the date as soon as we know it. And for now, I want to thank you all very much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you.